Hello. <laughs> hello, 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 and welcome to today's Power Hour. I'm going to try to pull up our chat here. Uh, hope everyone's doing well. Apologize for being two minutes late. A slight technical difficulty on my side, but glad that you're with us now. Just looking for this live stream so I can be able to get all the comments, try to see those things as they are happening. How's your day going? Where are you guys uh, listening in from today? How's your day going? Oh. Okay, okay, okay. Cool, cool, cool. We have this up and going. I will now be able to see the comments as they're coming in. Welcome. Welcome. We'll play uh, some music and wait for a couple minutes for some people to jump on with us. Hey, Auntie. So wait like one or two more minutes. Uh, team, today we're going to be talking about risk assessment. If you're like, why risk assessment? Why risk mitigation and management? Because it's actually super essential. There's some really key points um, that are used in uh, things like adventure tourism that help um, maintain a high level of professionalism and safety. And I'm not saying like be professional in your own time, you know, like in your own home and things, but uh, these principles of safety, when we attach them to some pretty awesome, practical, easy practices, uh, personifying those principles, of course, make our lives easier. So that's what we're going to be talking about. <gasps> whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, Kilia Sky, did they used to play this on PBS? They might have. Um, if you know this song, I don't know the song. I heard it in an elevator. Um, so this is a song. If you know the name of the song, it would be awesome to know as well. All right, all right, all right. Let's get going. It's 12.05. Let's make it happen. What? Shift happens, y'all. Shift happens okay <clears throat> hello hello and welcome uh i guess i mean to start out thank you 37 people for being with us 38 people for being with us um and thank you to the native wellness institute for of course putting these power hours on huge media archive uh that's getting bigger and bigger okay hold up i just saw that bob ross used to use that one perfect thank you i will search that song <clears throat> Um, yes, thank you to the Native Wellness Institute for, for carrying this on. Uh, I am uncertain, but I'm sure we'll get it up here in the chat soon. The number of this power hour. Guys, we are pushing on in this pandemic. Things are strange. Uh, things are great. Um, things can even be frustrating at times. But nevertheless, with the technology that we have available and the lives that we're living, as well as the gift of this beautiful blue ball floating through space is a good time to be alive. So let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's get talking about these things. <clears throat> uh, my name is Joshua Cocker, and I'm grateful to be with you guys today. I am Koe Gu on my mom's side, Kiowa from Oklahoma. Uh, and my, my family's over there are Paddle Tea and Toibo. Um, <clears throat> on my dad's side, I'm Tongan uh, from the Kingdom of the South Pacific, which has been kind of famous lately with its massive volcanic eruption. Um, and I was born in New Zealand, but I'm not in any of those places. If you watch this power hour, you might already guess I am coming at you guys from Santa Inez, California, just outside of Santa Barbara. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I have something in my throat. So, uh, here with our, our two beautiful children, uh, Antok is our four-year-old boy and then Toge Ahoroma is our beautiful girl and she's 
close to 19 months now coming up in a couple of days 10 days uh on 19 months and yeah we're excited to have you in the spare room so welcome welcome to to the blurred out office it's not messy but just wanted to blur it out anyways uh <laughs> if you guys wouldn't mind as well joining me in the chat so again we're going to be talking about risk assessment and risk mitigation and it's important and like it's important in our everyday life um it really does have a place and actually like we have an ongoing risk uh risk assessment like <clears throat> excuse me formula that we use and it might be quite emotionally based or maybe it's very practical in terms of like if these things do not serve me i will not be in those places uh but we're gonna we're gonna talk about you know how we can incorporate all of these different faculties that we have at our disposal our mental emotional spiritual physical uh and then we're gonna hopefully come away with some hard uh hard skills hard practices what, we, what am i saying what am i some some practical things we can come away with and actually do actionable points there you go um by the end of this by the end of our time together so <clears throat> grateful grateful for you guys to be with us and again please join us in the chat so all the presenters that come on all of the the people who work for the native wellness institute indigenous 20 somethings project and all of our guest speakers incredible insights and beautiful words always shared and i just want to encourage everyone in our chat as well please uh share with us too if there's something that you hear that you, oh i have something i want to say in that man type away because your voice when added to this again massive media archive that we're building uh, together is going to contribute to the greater resilience of our people, even though it's on Facebook. It's totally a thing. It's totally a thing. All right, so here we go. <clears throat> uh, I just want to start out with kind of like how we got to this, uh, this place and why it has been so present in my mind. Um, I, I actually professionally and through school got my start post construction. Uh, through outdoor adventure and facilitation. It's what I went to school for back home in New Zealand. In Wellington, New Zealand, I went to Fitzroy. And it was super cool to be there. Uh, we were qualified as instructors to be able to teach whitewater kayaking, sea kayaking, uh, off-track and on-track navigation, just like hiking uh, with a little bit more <laughs> of the hardcore technical stuff. Uh, and then rock climbing. So a vast array of skills that we were learning uh, at our time in school and everything that we were going through was all about safety and trust so safety was number one trust was like number two because the people that we're with have to rely on us when we left school and started guiding and working in search and rescue there were real life uh, serious consequences if we were not safe and if we did not have already fostered that trust so that we could rely on it when giving direction uh, and so that we could pull on it when asking people to take healthy risks. Sound familiar? We say that a lot when we're working with NWI. So <clears throat> uh, just really quickly, um, what, what uh, I guess we'll start out with like a, a little definition of the word risk. Let me get a dictionary definition so that I'm not like making this up as we go. Risk meaning, mm -hmm. probably could already have that pulled up, huh? Okay, cool. Uh, situation involving exposure to danger. That is what the dictionary uh, definition of risk is. I would add as well, uh, for there to be a possibility of um, some sort of addition to your life uh, or subtraction. So it might be... You get to keep all your hands and toes or you lose them or you have the greatest like adventurous experience of your life or it, you know, drives you further down the rabbit hole and you become more afraid of everything. I think risk is, yeah, definitely a situation involving exposure and danger, but there is always when associated with risk, um, a potential to be able to gain something and or lose something. So I would add that to that. OK, cool. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to be talking about in terms of like risk. When we say that word, that's what we're talking about. <clears throat> I want to give just a few examples of uh, to kind of give us a foundation to build upon. There's a few different ways to define risk. 
because even though it's easily defined in the dictionary, uh, just a short one sentence, it's actually very difficult to define in real life. So what I would say <clears throat> is this, that there are perceived risks and real risk. This is a framework of thought and language that was not actually mine. It was given to me by an instructor uh, who was teaching me at school and his name was Mike. So Mr. Mike, sir, if you're watching, um, was talking about the difference between perceived risk and real risk. And he was talking about how uh, perceived risk is, is just, it's just in your head. It's when you have a lack of information. It's when the dark is scary for children, right? Oh, there's a monster in my closet. Where did you get that? Maybe it was a movie. Maybe it's just a feeling. Maybe when the lights go out and that feeling of uncertainty creeps up on us, that is what fears us. And so in order to validate that fear, we have to create something in our mind's eye so that we can say, ah, that is what I am afraid of because I don't understand this. So the monster in the closet. Um, perceived risk can, uh, can also be... Um, I use this example a lot, um, and I'm not hyper-focused on young people trying to find love, but I'll just kind of use this example again, this idea of like, if I were to, as a young man in high school, ask a girl out and she says no, all of a sudden my world would be crushed, who am I, what am I even doing, is my job at Arby's worth it, like that is a perceived risk, yeah, and so that perceived risk might stop me from asking that person out or maybe even asking that guy to join our rugby team whatever it may be that perceived risk is based more in my own thoughts feelings and unknown uh rather than like what actually is so i wanna let me see if i can grab something here nope it's gone but um uh, strangely they're around here somewhere there are a whole bunch of carabiners I have. Just off screen right here are a bunch of climbing gear um, that I've been collecting over the years with the hope to being able to start an adventure-based learning company. So hopefully this all takes off soon. Otherwise, I waste my money. But this gear is a great tool in order to be able to talk about these things. Uh, when we're climbing, we'll use rope like this. This is a, I believe it's a 10 mil, yeah, 10 millimeter um, diameter rope, and it has four layers, and it is a dynamic rope, which means it will stretch when you fall on a rock. Sounds scary, maybe. Um, <clears throat> this rope uh, has the the ability to be able to to hang like a a small van off of it, most definitely. Um, what Toyota Corolla so you could hang that off of off of one of these ropes however if when you attach someone to one of these ropes um, immediately their fear begins to build um, if they're already nervous about it I've seen a lot of people in a lot of different places in the world start to kind of freak out oh my gosh I'm putting my life on the line like you want me to defy gravity and ascend up this cliff face tied to a shoelace and it's like well essentially but not quite there's like a few more there's a big difference actually between shoelace and this rope so <clears throat> those those thoughts and those feelings are are real and valid so long as the person remains ignorant to uh to, to what the gear actually is so if they actually knew how strong the rope was and they actually knew that the safest place for them was 20 feet off the ground and above, then they wouldn't be so afraid of going up. You know, the idea of like, all I have to do is make it this first 20 feet and the likelihood of me actually hitting the ground is next to zero. On top of that, the gear is gonna hold me. Um, if I were to shock load this gear with a massive factor two fall, I'd be fine. I'd be fine. Um, <clears throat> and so we as instructors are able to like, not kind of dump information on those people, but because we understand the real risk, versus their perceived risk, we can say, oh, cool. I understand what you're thinking and what you're feeling. Um, it's, it's actually pretty safe, man. Like consider this. One thing I would say all the time when instructing rock climbing is uh, consider how many people have been climbing on rocks and how many rock accidents you've actually heard of. I was like, oh, I don't know. And sometimes they'll be like, well, that one famous guy way back when in the 80s, with some obscure example. I mean, it's not to say that accidents don't happen. It's just to say that this is really safe, man. 
And maybe some of the things that we're feeling are based more on emotion and the unknown rather than like what actually is. Um, <clears throat> so is this starting to sound familiar? Are we starting to draw parallels to like our own spaces and places and the things that we're thinking and feeling? The truth of the matter is that adventure is out there don't sue me disney i know that was big in the movie up but adventure really is out there man and there's a lot of great things to be gained from hard experiences in life scary experiences in life and if we are the type of people who can see the difference between real risk and perceived risk we don't have to be scared and we can make actual sound decisions on what is going to be best for us in our lives and how we can share those experiences after we've had them and mastered them with other people too. So, <clears throat> um, I'm trying to keep up in the comments. We got a few things in here. If you uh, if you have any questions as we're going through, again, I want to encourage you guys. Please, please share your questions. You might be thinking something that someone else is thinking as well, just hasn't typed it in yet. So, <clears throat> we want to make this as much of a interactive process as disposable today perfect perfect so what are some of those adventures what are some of those pursuits as they're so professionally called in that industry seriously what are the things that you're pursuing right now is it a higher income a new job better relationship with your animals better relationship with your parents being able to resolve a conflict at work uh what what are you um what are you pursuing right now? That is the adventure that we're going to be using as a lens to measure this conversation against. Uh, oh, there is a question in here. So let me just get to this. Where are you planning on doing your outdoor adventure school? Ah, good question. Um, outdoor adventure school. It's not really a school. In order to be able to have a school, there's like a whole bunch of logistical stuff, blah, blah, blah. But um, it's an outdoor adventure-based learning program, and it's all over. So... Uh, Hit me up uh, on Facebook and I'll, I'll shoot the information there to you. Um, <clears throat> focusing on school while being a mom and a wife. Beautiful, Delina. Awesome. Awesome. We all have these these goals that we're working towards. And if you're like, oh, no, I don't actually know if I have a goal that I'm working towards. Ah, this is the time to get one. This is the time to get one. The fact of the matter is you can never be stagnant. The river doesn't ever stop flowing. You're either intentional with where you're going or you're just being moved by the river but you are moving in one direction or another so goals are important um <clears throat> i hope that that as we're talking about these things we're able to 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 really kind of nail it there's a there's a there's a couple of uh there's a couple of good things that came out of schooling when i was uh when i was younger um yeah we're having too many goals for sure uh, and, and one of the things that was that was talked about, there was this moment where we were down at the bottom in the Tadadua Ranges, which is uh, by Otaki in New Zealand and like the southern point of the North Island. And we're there at like four in the morning and we got to like ascend some 1500 plus meters, which is, is I mean, it's, it's high. So one meter is like three feet, some, uh, relatively close to three feet uh, in one day. And it's, it's pretty big. It's a pretty big push. I was like out of shape, man, and I hadn't been drinking enough water. And you know when you show up to a place and it's like, not that you're underdressed, but you're underprepared for what's about to happen. And all you can do is just ask, please be gentle. <laughs> Dude, that mountain was not gentle at all. So we're standing there at the bottom of this hill looking up and I'm like, oh, frick, this is about to be a long day. And all of us start talking in this kind of way. Oh, yeah, man, dude, I'm so not ready for this. Oh, I got the worst sleep ever. All of a sudden, we're like talking about, you know, our lifelong confessions. Maybe if I didn't cut the line in first grade, I would be more prepared for what's about to happen. And our instructor, again, kind of cut us off. And he was like, hey, hey, all you need to do is put one foot in front of the other and don't stop until you get to even ground. Take a little bit of a break and keep moving. Right? That's all you got to do. And uh, I was like, oh, easy for you to say, bro. You get paid to be in shape. But so we got on our walk and we started moving. And uh, lo and behold, it really was that hard. It was exactly as hard as I thought it was going to be. But it was also just as easy as Mike had said. It was just a matter of putting one foot in front of the other. And what kept on getting in the way of my own feet was not the elevation 
that we were hiking at, it was not the grade of the terrain or how steep the hill was. It was not how wet the roots were that we were walking on top of. It was my own head. It was my own head. I was projecting this, this, uh, I was projecting this outcome on, on, on the world around me. And as I was projecting it in real time, my body was responding. Oh, I'm tired, man. I can't do this. So I would stop. You can do this, bro. All you need to do is get to that bush right there. You see that bush? Just walk to that bush. Ugh. Slowly. And then I made it. And it really kind of woke me up to the idea of, yeah, you totally can do things. 100%. There's really not much out there that is beyond us um, in a literal sense. Physically, right now, maybe. Mentally, I guess if I never studied for it. Emotionally, if I didn't prepare or get the right help for it, maybe yeah, it would be beyond us right now. But that doesn't mean that it's always going to be that way. And and the reason why I wanted to share that is, is to this, we're all, you know, as we're facing these daunting adventures in our life, we're all being faced with um, our own inner voice, our, our own inner dialogue. Uh, I, I kind of share this um, a lot when I'm training with NWI. Uh, so you might have heard me say this before. And hopefully it's helpful if you've, you're hearing it again. This idea that, like the world is not this painting that we're viewing. It's not a picture we get to all share. It's like a blank canvas. And our mind and our heart is like the paintbrush. So in considering that... Uh, Oh, I guess to paint that picture a little bit better, so we have a, a real good understanding of that. If you were to ask everyone in LA, um, if you were to ask everyone in LA, like, how was your day? Now, I don't know how many people are in LA. There's a lot, though. Millions? I'll go with that. Then you'd get millions of different answers. And the reason is because it has nothing to do with the weather. And it has nothing to do with the traffic. And it had nothing to do with the timing of the lights. It had everything to do with their own inner dialogue and had everything to do with what was being invited from them in the environments that they were interacting with kind of a an intense notion i do want to be careful though because there is this idea of like um pull yourself up by your bootstraps you'll be okay just tough it out it's all right that that doesn't work that's not what i mean at all there are situations that are outside of our control that, that affect us for a very long time. Intergenerational trauma. I'm a big believer in that. Colonialism. Born out of colonization. Even though it happened hundreds of years ago, the process of those hardships are continuing through colonialism. I'm a big believer in that too. You can't just bootstrap that stuff. You got to get down and do the work. So <clears throat> this is not going to be a conversation that we can directly apply to everything and everyone. And I would encourage you know some of us out there for hearing this and like i can do this i can just like bootstrap this and I'll, I'll, I'll be okay let's use this conversation to get some information uh and be real about our experiences and if it's bigger than us let's get that help let's get that help okay so <clears throat> um oh we got a couple of questions and then we'll go back to what we were just saying so one was had the same dream for many years but afraid to take the step towards the dream for the sake i won't wake yo uh and my future lies there in their paw uh i'm going out from washington state hey yo all right jay do it bro i believe in you um that's what i would say to that my man uh and then uh da -da -da -da. We, we had a um one other question i believe um oh i seem to have lost it here we go how do you apply this to the fear of re-entering life after having COVID? Mass information leads to perceived fear. My goal is just getting back to work. Awesome. Yes. What a great question. Uh, we're totally going to be touching back on that. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I won't use your exact example, but I will be using COVID as a way to paint that picture. Thank you for asking that. That's awesome. Okay. So <clears throat> this idea of like, we can just set these small goals. And we can just push to these small goals. And as we push these small goals, there's a part of us that begins to like wake up, right? For hiking, there's a little bit more to it. You're, you're moving your body physically. You're challenging yourself mentally. 
uh, you, I believe, in my own personal opinion, and this is born out of like the teachings of our people, reach new spiritual heights when you get up to like physically high places. Um, and then, you know, your your emotional state improves because you're like, oh man, I did it, I accomplished it. Your physical state's like, we're tired. You sleep a couple of days, eat some good food, and you're good, man, stronger, ready for more. <clears throat> These, uh, these goals that we're working towards, these things that we're moving towards are going to help us um, not necessarily wake up our better selves, but they're going to help us find what is more, what is in there. Uh, and that's a good thing, man. That is a good thing. Whether we're pushing for hundreds of miles for months at a time, or we are, you know, just trying to, just trying to be able to reach those goals of morning and evening uh, meditation and prayer. I, I knew uh, uh, one of my friends, he was um, preparing to uh, preparing for a navigation leg <clears throat> with, a, with a celestial navigation school, sailing school back home in New Zealand. And one of his goals for an entire year was to wake up every morning and pray with the sunrise. And I was like, wow, how poetic. Bro, do you know how rough that is? For 365 days to wake up every morning with the sunrise. Like, you got to be pretty strict on your schedule there. These things are going to be good for us. Whatever it is that you have um, in your heart, it's going to be good for you. And uh, to go along with what Mike was saying about the idea of, like, all you have to do is put one foot in front of the other. Yeah, nice. I like that. Uh, I'd like to add one more thing to it as well. In my community, sometimes you hear things like... Um, in, in my uh, in my community, sometimes you hear things like, uh, the mountain will make you ready as you go. That's a really cool one, too. And I actually think that's a little bit more applicable to our situation here. The mountain will make you ready as you go. The implication of that statement is there's nothing you can do that could actually prepare you for what you're about to go through. So just go with the preparation that you have and expect that the world will help you along your way. We talk about ancestral power. We talk about the resilience of our bloodlines. We talk about, um, you know, the, the power of positive thinking. Uh, we talk about a number of different medicines that we can draw towards us. Everything that is in existence is, you know, striving to help us in our success. And we get to define that success. What a beautiful thought. It's not like, oh, you have to succeed like this and then I'll help you. No, man, the trees will be for you no matter what you do. You could quit everything right now, burn every bridge you've ever made, be a bum, and it would still, like, the trees would still breathe for you. So that's beautiful. That's beautiful. True. Honest. Um, freedom. Inherent freedom. Simply just by being you. Uh, <clears throat> this idea uh, of uh, the, the mountain makes you ready as you go. I, I hope that we all have our own examples that we're drawn on. As, as, as that said, I hope it's not like we're sitting there like, mm, yeah. I remember when X, Y, and Z happened. Uh, because the fact of the matter is, this is not some foreign process. I mean, this is probably not anything new either. Uh, hopefully, this is something that you have experienced or are experiencing. And know that because you have experienced or are experiencing, that it will continue to happen and or will happen again. And it's just a matter of us being able to make real sound decisions. All right. <clears throat> so, back to this idea of risk, exposing ourselves to certain things, elements, in order to be able to potentially gain and or lose something. Um, COVID is a really, really big pressure in our lives today. And it's super funny. I've seen a lot of people, um, part of our schooling, let me just say this, part of our schooling back home in New Zealand was going through EMT training. So when we were going through EMT training, they really, and I mean really, nailed it into our heads that there is a scope of work, that you are limited to the things that you are able to do. And so what that meant is if you are able to do these things, then these are the things that you are expected to do. If it is beyond your scope, then you need to know who to go to. Is Do you talk to the paramedic? Do you, um, you know, talk to a, a doctor? Like... What, what are the things, and not necessarily like, oh, can you teach me how to be able to? Like, no, if you can't do it, then you can't do it. You have a scope and you're set in your in your space and then you have to reach out for other things. So <clears throat> um, that really helped out a lot. And so there was a lot of information as it was coming out in COVID where my mind was like, 
I'm going to listen to what doctors are saying. I'm going to listen uh, to what these experts and these uh, and, and virologists are saying. Like what they're saying is going to be what I'm going to hear. And what I heard them say was, you know, this is new. We've never really encountered this. This pandemic might take ah, forever to get a hold of. Like it might be years. Remember that March 2020 it was like might be years to get a, a vaccine. Then boom, months later, it's like yo, all right, cool. Um, so, so as, as this was happening, my, our, my mind was just like, keep up on the information, keep up on the evolution of that information so that we can make this, the, the best decisions possible. Once we have all that information, what do we do with it? What do we do with it? Look at our risks in terms of potential gain and potential loss. It is a different game when we are looking at information as it's giving to us. And that is such... A beautiful thing once we are armed with information we can choose to move out of perceived risk into real risk and all of a sudden when we move from perceived risk to real risk and we're owning our decisions in those moments bro it's it's pretty fine like the the, the confidence that comes from being validated by those decisions as well as um, just just like the the what would I, what would I call that it's, it's similar to confidence, but it's a little bit beyond. Like your ability to thrive in situations will exponentially grow as we, as we learn how to, to master the skill of understanding perceived and real risk. <clears throat> uh, for, for us in our house, we have two young children. Um, and this is just, this is just uh, because it was asked earlier. I'm gonna, gonna talk about this. And we know that COVID is infecting a lot of young people um, or, or is infecting more young people than previous strains uh, with the Omicron variant and also the Delta variant. So <clears throat> what we're doing is in our home with the information that's coming out, it is a task to stay up on it too. And it can be a lot. And at times you just have to turn it off and just like go to bed. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're monitoring <clears throat> using state resources, like what's going on in our area, checking the different shades of colors in terms of infections reported, hospitalizations. Uh, and then we as a family decide who will we interact with. And if we're not comfortable or feel like there is a bit of room for trust to be able to grow, then we'll ask very direct questions like, hey man, who do you hang out with? What's your schedule look like? We're just trying to keep our kids safe. Once we get those kinds of uh, answers and information from our friends and family, they'll be like, yeah, we'll come, we'll hang out with you guys. Um, yeah, and, and we're, we're trying just to, to keep things um, going, right? It's not necessarily about going back to something. This idea, oh, the new normal. Oh, are we going, we're going back to the old normal. Like Things are not ever meant to go back to the way that they were. That's not how that goes. Like If you were to get back with your ex, it wouldn't be the same as when it first happened, right? It's never happening again, man. Like It's just once, bro. So once we're, once we're moving, this is the normal. And the normal will continue to evolve. And uh, that's just how it is. So we're just trying to be able to mitigate what's going on while, while keeping up on what we need to keep up on. So um, be brave, man. Be safe. Be brave. Uh, and, and you got this. When it, comes to, when it comes to COVID, don't let those things kind of overpower you as an individual. There's a lot of things we can do too, right? So it's like, oh, man, if I were to go into uh, a mall, for example, um, if I were to go into a mall, for example, there's a lot of like variables that I can't control. Maybe all those variables that I can't control start to build up and and project like perceived risk. Oh, no, I probably shouldn't go because of X, Y and Z. Uh, and this is just an example. I'm not telling anyone to go to a mall, but you can wear a mask, a face shield, a hazmat suit. There's so many things we could personally do in order to be able to make sure that we're safe in those spaces and whatever it takes to feel safe in those spaces. Do it. When we're doing what we feel is right in the moment that we feel it's right to do it, it's the most important thing we could do. Here's what happens when we don't do that. If we feel it's right to do something, and it's like a moment, right? Oh, man, I should call my sister right now. Oh, dang, dude. I should help that guy out. Like, Oh, I, sh I should probably help that uh, or hold the door open for this young mother with her two kids. Like, Whatever it is, do it. When we do not do what we feel is right in the moment that we feel it's right to do it. It's a moment of self-betrayal and that's dangerous. 
So this is what happens. Once we've gathered all the information and we have a real understanding of what's going on and we plug in our little plans, our goals, and we say, this is, this is what I can do with what's going on. I feel comfortable with this. We make a move. If we're not uh, doing what feels right in the moment that we feel it's right to do it and we create those moments of self-betrayal, we have to find a way to justify those moments. Hold the door open. We'll go back to that example. Hold the door open for this mother who's coming in with these two kids. No, no, it's it's, it's COVID. Um, I'm 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 not gonna do that. That that's that's one thing that we could say. Or, or I these people have been waiting for me at this table for like twenty minutes. I need to go. She can even get the door herself. She's got a kid who's walking. You can open the door for him. After. Uh, a little while of, of justifying um, if there's any kind of feeling that comes up like, oh, you should have done that, right? That internal conflict, that opposing opinion, that water to the fire, you should have done that. Then we'll use that tool of justification to go to war, like sword fight, with, with that internal feeling, <laughs> that feeling of we believe that was right. No, no, no. Like I said, they had a kid who could walk and he could open the door for them. You know, all these things. I, I, I didn't want to be late to this table that these people have been waiting for me. Like, come on, man. Be real, realistic with what's going on. Well, you know, holding a door open would have only taken a few moments. And uh, it probably would have helped her out. And you thought that it should have happened. So you should have just done it. No, but seriously, like all of a sudden, these people who have been waiting for me at the table have to become more important, right? Because that's the idea. Oh, you could have you could have done it. Like you, you had the time. No, 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 no. I'm going to justify. So I'm going to inflate the importance of these people. No, they've been waiting for 15 minutes. I'm not going to wait make them wait anymore. Like not even a few seconds. And and I've I've been waiting to see these people forever as well, you know? Aha. So and it just goes on and on and on and on. Um until eventually it can turn into, and it can turn into, this is a very extreme example for this example, but we'll use it anyways. It can turn into like, well, that woman needs to get her own door anyways, you know? Like, her kids should know better and open the door for their mother, and all of a sudden we're using our own justification as a way to hurt these people so that we don't feel bad. Dude, that's what happens when we don't do what is right when we feel it's right to do it. We have to justify our own worldview, and that leads to self-deception. And the self-deception I'm talking about is we become more important than everyone else in their feelings. Everyone else in their thoughts. Everyone else in their words. Literally. Um, <clears throat> it, can also, it can also look like this Isaac's example a lot. Uh, <laughs> my friend Shailene and I, she works for the Native Wellness Institute. Um, the homies for a while. We're going to, hypothetically, there's nothing happening. We're still homies. <laughs> but if we were to have, like, an argument, Shailene and I, like, ah, oh, gosh, Shailene. And I were talking to everyone, right? Like, yeah, 45 people. Shailene, like, you know, said she was going to pay me back for that Big Mac in 2017. And guess who's waiting? This guy, you know? Um, and, and I'm using this as a, as a point of conflict. Uh, and I'm going to self-justify. And all of a sudden... Uh, Shailene doesn't become my friend anymore. She doesn't get to be that because I'm justifying my own actions. She becomes um, a vehicle for my aggression. She becomes an object that I can use to validate my own thoughts to random people so they can ally with me so I can feel better about my own problems. And then she also becomes an obstacle that stands in the way of my happiness, right? Dude, if you gave me that $3, Shailene, I would be happy. But that's not the case. I would have put that down payment on that house, too, if you just pay me back for that Big Mac. But you're holding up my life goals, man. Like, that's not how that works. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it is how it works. Um, and in those spaces, when we're in those moments of, uh, when we're in those moments, uh, no, you don't owe me for a Big Mac, Shailene. <laughs> um, in those spaces, when, when we're in those moments of self-betrayal and justification, that's how it goes, man. Everyone that, uh, everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we feel can become a weapon that we use to continue in this 
I don't know. I was just looking. Picture of BS, man. In order to be able to keep our justification alive, we have to view people as obstacles, objects, uh, or vehicles. And so let me paint it this way too. Like, so Shailene comes in, right? And all freaking 43 plus one are standing in a room. And like, oh, here she comes, here she comes, here she comes. And Shailene walks right in. And it's like, hey, um, Shay, Shay comes up. She goes, hey, man, it's been a while, dude. I haven't seen you since uh, December. How have you been? And I'm like, oh, I've been so good. It's good to see you, too. I give her a hug. And then she's like, oh, I got to take this call. Like, no, no problem, no problem. I'll catch you up when you come back. As soon as she walks away, we're like, oh, my gosh, can you believe that? I'm freaking Big Mac, bro. Like, how could you not walking around here like you don't owe me money? And then uh, everyone else in the circle, because we're allying here, right? It's like, yeah, Josh, it's so nice of you to be kind to people like that. Like, oh, it's so good that you're above that. You know, way not to be petty, bro. That right there is a perfect example. And we all freaking know. Like, we've been there, bro. In those moments, that is born out of self-deception. Actually, it has nothing to do with Shailene at all. That has everything to do with me and my own thoughts. Okay, so now we're going back. Gathering information so that we can make sound decisions. Gathering information that we can make sound decisions. Based on what? Your dreams, man. That's what. That's, that's what. Your dreams. So we're talking about the goals that you have these mountains you want to climb, these adventures you wanted to go on. And here we are presented with all the information that we can have. Literally all the information that we can have. Sometimes it's not necessarily the case. I know, for example, there was a community that I was, um, uh, that, that, that I had been a part of for some time. There's a lot of gatekeeping. And in those moments, information was intentionally being withheld from people so that others could look better. Um, so I guess in those moments, yeah, information is not like 100% out there for everyone all the time, but there is always something that we can do. There is always a goal that we can set in order to be able to help us along our way. The good things that have come to you in your life, your wants, your desires came to you. They didn't come to me. Um, and it's important that we do our best to be able to breathe life into those things and to feed those fires so that they can create a space for us to belong to. When we belong to those spaces, it will give others permission to belong there as well. Um, Martin Sensmeyer, he's a good example of that. He was in a movie with, uh, he was in a Rootness Tootness movie. What was it? Magnificent Seven, that's what it was. Where he was the, the lone Indian and a posse of cowboys made up of Mexicans, blacks, Asian dudes, and a couple of white guys. And it was cool, man. It was cool. I, I didn't know anything about the guy. All I knew is that when I saw that that guy in the movie, I was like, yo, that's a real freaking Indian. Like, the cheekbones gave him away, is what it was. Um, I was like, this is cool, man. Like, I'm glad we're getting this kind of representation. You know, the, the, the list goes on. Um, people who have done it first, people who have done it best, once those things have happened, it gives them permission to be able to, it gives permission for other people uh, to, to, to be able to, um, you know, live their dreams, man, and, and push that envelope as well. The six minute mile is a good example too, right? That was talked about for ages. People were like, it's impossible, physically impossible to be able to run a six minute mile. Uh, and then all of a sudden there was a six minute mile. And then all of a sudden there's a sub six minute mile. And now we're like pushing, I think sub four, sub five, one of those two numbers It's fast, man. People are freaking fast. But this idea of like, once you do it, um, then you'll give permission for others to be able to belong to those spaces and you'll give them permission to just by inviting them to, uh, to, to fulfill their own, you know, dreams, hopes, and desires. You might want to just make pancakes. Maybe that was the mountain you wanted to climb today, but the way that you make your pancakes is different than anyone else. So what you're doing, bro, is the first of its kind. Your dreams are super unique and special. Even if you're just adding to something that's already been done. They're unique and special. You're unique and special. All of creation is, is fighting for you to be able to succeed. The ocean and the trees are breathing for you right now. The animals are out walking around with ticks all over their body waiting to give themselves to you so that you can live another day. Water loves you um, with, with no expectation. No expectation. I think one of the cool things is like, no matter what you do, you always get those gifts. But one of the hard things for me personally to think about at times is like, even if I don't do the things that I feel is right, I'll still get the, that help. 
And it doesn't like guilt or shame me out. Like, no, nah, nah, he should earn it. No, it's not what it's about. But it's like, dang. How would I feel if I got to the end of my road and didn't do what I felt was right in the moment that I felt it was right to do it? Having all of these things helping me along my way. How would I feel? Uh, and and that, that part is like, you know, I'm going to make use of this gift. I'm going to do my best. Um, not aiming for perfection, but aiming for participation. All right, cool. So we talked about a couple of things. Um, I've been trying to, uh, trying to keep up in the chat as we go. Uh, let me just, uh, let me just check this out real quick. I, I, I do want to be able to <laughs> Shailene, do I owe you a Big Mac? Nah. Okay, okay, okay. We'll keep going, and if, if anything else comes up in the chat, I'll try to follow them. Um, cool. So, so risk assessment, risk management, mitigation—it's super important, man. Right? Safety and trust are the two biggest parts um, when it comes to like adventure tourism. Your life is an adventure, and you're not a tourist. Safety and trust is key. You got to trust yourself. You got to trust yourself. You got to trust yourself to be safe and look out for your own best interest because the fact of the matter is no one else is going to look out for it as well as you can. And that's just how it is. Not your parents, not your grandparents, not your children, not your spouse, not your boyfriend, not your cat, nobody. Um, and so being able to have uh, a good method to be able to, to gain information, right? To welcome information, invite information so that you can be closer to that real risk and, and uh, staying away from that perceived risk so that we're able to like thrive in every situation that we find ourselves in is key, is key. Okay. <clears throat> um, I do want to go back to, to something that we were talking about and uh, share an, another thought. Um, you were talking about risk management, but the focus is like conflict resolution almost. Yeah, I do that a lot because I feel like it's very important. Um, conflict resolution uh, in my mind and interdependent communication is like the key to life because life is just about connections. Um, and not so much it's like, oh yeah, it's who you know, bro. But uh, it's more about like, um, what do people say when they're struggling with mental illnesses? What do they like, I feel alone. When was your lowest point and you felt alone? Um, that to me is something that we should trust. And it sounds like a lack of connection. So the ability to connect, pretty important. Um, and this is what we're talking about here. In order to be able to achieve our goals, we have to be connected. Not only the world around us, but first with ourselves and the voice inside. I want to go back to this idea of like doing what we feel is right in the moment that we feel it's right to do it is going to be one of the keys to success and self-mastery. The ability by self-mastery, I mean the ability to self-correct. We need mentors only as long as we are able to self-correct. Once we learn how to be able to self-correct, a lot of the things that we need to learn, we can actually do ourselves. We don't need someone holding our hand the whole time. Um, and which is how it's meant to be, right? We had coming of age ceremonies where you were mentored by the community. Then you had this sort of kind of act of proving um, physical exertion. And then after that, the community was like, ah, I see that you are now able to competently, you know, uh, traverse this wilderness step and, and be able to function in these ways. You don't necessarily need us holding your hand the whole time. Boom. Poof, stamp of approval on the forehead. You're an adult. Um, so that's good. That's good. Uh, so as we're talking about, um, self-betrayal and doing what we feel is right in the moment that we feel it's right to do it. When we, when we have those moments of self-betrayal, uh, it's, it's just like anything else. We can build a habit out of it. And it's very difficult to see once we're in those, uh, cycles, once we've created a habit of, uh, oh, killed up. Um, once we've created a habit of, of deceiving ourselves, it just gets easier and easier and easier. Um, and then it's not only like, oh, I'm not going to hold that door for that person, but then it becomes like, how dare you ask me that question? What are you, some kind of freaking moron? Like, of course, the cheese that's are in the next aisle. I told you that. Uh, or whatever it is. Like, whatever it is. Um, that act of self-deception 
um, an axe of self-deception, if not cold flake immediately, will naturally begin to lead to uh, cycles of violence. And I'm not talking about like you're going to go Hulk and bust through the wall like a big old pitcher of Kool-Aid or something. What I mean by violence is that you will hurt yourself because that's where the sign of violence is found in a hurt, not a hit. So as you hurt yourself, remember that internal dialogue we were talking about earlier? Because you, I wasn't putting down anyone else. Those thoughts were coming from my own head. Oh, you could have just taken a few seconds. Like, no, no. <laughs> um, as we hurt ourselves, we will begin to normalize that pain and that violence. And when we normalize it, it will move from outside of our home. And then we will begin to impose that violence on the people around us. <clears throat> How could that possibly be helpful? For us on our walk towards our goals to the many adventures that we seek in life it's not it's not it's just a, it's it's it is something that will 100 percent forever get in our way um so my invitation to to everyone here is uh when you feel like you should do something let's start doing that let's start doing that and if you are like wow I might be in a, a moment of self-deception. Let's do what we can to change those things. Just because it is some way today doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever. And as we're viewing like our, our goals, you know, through the lens of our lives, our hopes and our, our desires, uh, let the mountain speak for itself, man. Don't be taking on the fears of other people. You might be sitting there talking to someone who's like, yeah, I really want to make pancakes, but like instead of bananas, put like beetroot in it, you know what I mean? And then someone who hates beetroot would be like, why would you do that? That's the worst. You might as well put pineapple on pizza, which is a good thing. If you think pineapple on pizza is wrong, man, we should have a discussion after this. But so this idea of like telling someone else and then their ideas being just as valid as yours when it comes to like, nah, you definitely shouldn't do that. Um... You know, be weary of those things, man. Like, you're you're the main character of your own story. You're the one who's going to be going on this journey. If you really want to do it, and you're like, no, I should definitely do this, but I didn't, yeah, I don't feel like it's right. To, then do it. You know, the cool thing about that is, like, it's a really great tool to be able to refine over a long period of time. You know, the fact of the matter is, it's like, are you always going to be right? No, no, because we're not perfect people. But if we're wrong... We could be like, whoo, you know what? Let me use my perceived and real risk factors here, gather all the information. I wanted to arrive at a point where like everyone was happy, but uh, actually no one's happy. So maybe I should just tweak what I do next. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll do the same thing in a different way so that we can arrive at a different place because I still feel like this is the right thing. I'm going to put beetroot in pancakes. I've never actually done that. Um, if you do, let me know how it goes. But um, just just like stick to it, man. Stay stay with your stay with your goal, and uh, make it happen. Gather all the information that you can along your way, um, and and stay away from from perceived risk as much as possible. Creating a support system around us is also important. The uh, justification is a word that we've been using with kind of a negative connotation in this conversation, but actually in instructing outdoor instruction. You're supposed to use three points of, excuse me, three points of justification with every decision that you make. So I have a decision. I'm making this decision for this reason, this reason, this reason. Now I'm going to run it by my co-instructor. Hey, bro, this is what I think we should do. I think we should go down this ridge line, and I think we should do it for this reason, this reason, this reason. What do you think? And then his brilliant mind's going to sit there and be like, hmm, I see what you're thinking here. And he'll challenge my ideas. Uh, not putting down my ideas, not throwing my ideas away, not using me as an obstacle standing in the way of his own happiness, but like genuinely trying to be able to arrive at a good place together. You know, we don't all have to be working towards the same, uh, this, this, the same uh, goal here, but when we're all working towards our own goals, we can find the space in our, our own selves to be empathetic towards each other. Um, compassionate after we have empathy we can genuinely choose compassion and build each other up man build each other up and then we can be able to counsel and collaborate and it can become an interdependent and successful uh, space which is awesome 
which is awesome. Um, and, and and I've been talking forever. So we're coming up on an hour here, team. We're coming up on an hour here, team. And uh, I'm hoping that we've come away with some really practical takeaways. This idea of do what you feel is right in the moment that you feel is right to do it. This idea of avoiding violence. And it's not a hit talking about a hurt. Doing what we can to be able to mitigate risk by moving our mind, hearts, um, and, and just bodies, you know, out of that a perceived risk into real risk, grounded in information, uh, and then making choices, you know, that we own in our time. Um, you guys, you guys are awesome. And I want to thank you so much uh, for being with us. Um, there's a couple of things here in the chat that I want to shout out. We're over 400, 400 power hours. Dude, what? 400 hours? That's nuts. Um, yes, the t-shirts the and, and merch we got uh, through the Native Wellness Institute. Feel free to check those out. Uh, and I do want to shout out that uh, tomorrow, Thursday, the 20th and Friday, the 21st, we're having a new year, new you training, which is going to be going on both days from 10 p.m. to 3 p.m. each day with an hour break in between. Uh, so feel free to come along. It is free to come to this training. Woo -woo! Um, and you're going to be hearing from all kinds of uh, trainers from the Native Wellness Institute. You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. I believe in you. Uh, I am actually a fan of your work. So thanks for sharing your time with me. Uh, have a good day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.